Hello all, uh, Safira de la Sala from Brazil here, and I would like to share with you some empirical evidence we have of the relationship between pandemics For the lucky and ones, staying at home is boring. We asked planning and property scholars across the world as to what they think is the effect of COVID-19 pandemic is on property in land. This movie presents the views from a range of cities. COVID-19 is highlighting the fact that we need to think about, design, create, and engage with our urban environments differently. You've got to love yourself. Think for a minute what it means to receive the order to stay at home when you're a homeless person, a sidewalk dweller, or any of the one million slum dwellers who, according to the UN, live in neighborhoods where homes and streets are overcrowded, open spaces are inexistent, and service is deficient. The pandemic has reminded us of the geography of social life. Close physical proximity, the, the basis of social, cultural and economic life, has now become a space of risk and fear. Our very safety now depends, at least in part, on our spatiality. Apparently this pandemic is inviting us to revisit the notion of um, individual that came up during the enlightenment. The COVID-19 pandemic emphasizes the ambiguity of property. Lucky who owns land in times of pandemics. The question that I'd like to ask today is, how should property be viewed in a time of a global pandemic? What is the relationship between pandemics and property? Everything. The acute crisis of pandemic that we're experiencing today is just a prelude to the more chronic and possibly more devastating crises we'll experience in the foreseeable future. We stay at home right now, and home is defined by the boundaries of the property, by the boundaries of land. So you want in pandemics to own a big piece of land in some urban sprawl or rural area, because property in land means freedom in times of quarantine. As urban planners, that's not our perfect idea of how a city should look like. We work towards densification and the compact city. Reason enough to think about the relation between property and pandemics, in particular from a spatial planning perspective. COVID-19 is just the most recent disaster to present a challenge to the social and legal institution of private property. One way to understand the evolution of private property and land in the United States in the 20th century was as a result of disasters. These disasters were of varying types, Spatial, for example, early 20th century urbanization and post-World War II suburbanization. Ecological, for example, the early 20th century wholesale deforestation in the upper Midwest states. And industrial, the air and water pollution that led to the environmental protection laws of the 1960s and 1970s. Each of these disasters resulted in a significantly stronger public role over private property. Close physical proximity, the the basis of social, cultural and economic life has now become a space of risk and fear. Our very safety now depends, at least in part, on our spatiality. So biophysically we may be all in this together, but precarious property relations means that we're differently vulnerable. Private and common property always have been ambiguous. The virus emphasizes this ambiguity, however, and makes visible the need for property reform. The shared use of public spaces, public transport, public markets, and above all, the shared use of ambient air has spread the new coronavirus to almost every corner of the world. Is this perhaps the latest version of the tragedy of the commons? Nevertheless, the commons are vital for mitigating the dire consequences of COVID-19. The public use of urban parks for exercising or relaxing, as long as everybody practices physical distancing, helps everybody to stay healthy and sane. This pandemic has made me realize that property is only a whole with the people in these places and spaces. And this is so fragile the people 
And so these relationships can disappear so quickly with a pandemic. And then there is the physical void. For the lucky ones, staying at home is boring. It's restrictive. But for many others, home has become a place of confinement with limited or no opportunity to sit outside, to play or to socialise at a safe distance. The ability to go outside and to get fresh air has never been more important or so fiercely contested. COVID-19 has highlighted just how important, how precious and vital green spaces are, particularly in our urban areas. But it has also brought into sharp relief the inequalities that people face when trying to access these. Those who can converge on any and every green space available for exercise, for solace. We are using previously defunct spaces. We are traveling further from our beaten track and truly exploring our neighborhoods for the first time. You got to love yourself was a dominant motto for survival of the political prisoners in Greece during the military junta and this came back to us. But now our cell became our well-equipped home and the love for yourself became a place attachment theory. As I ponder pandemics and property rights, I'm actually pondering more the responses we've taken to the pandemic, especially the need to shelter in place, and even more than that, the responses to that response that some are taking in turn. I'm thinking especially in terms of what those responses mean for our ability to work through longer term and even more troubling threats posed by global climate change. We absolutely need to safeguard free speech and the rights to protest governmental policies we don't like. And we absolutely need to make sure that there are checks and balances in place so that governmental officials don't exceed their authorities. But the thing that has me troubled is the increasingly strident rhetoric used in protest, one that's framed in terms of American values, especially constitutional values. About 40% of the housing units in Sao Paulo or Rio, like the large centers, uh, rely on rent, not even to mention business, offices, shopping centers, and so on. And it's interesting to see that there, there are two movements. The first is that the government, the federal government, despite being working on a law to, to guide uh, private contracts during the pandemic, uh, they left outside uh, the scope of this law details on how to proceed on rent. The real estate lawyers that I have talked to, they are deeply concerned because the legal system, of course, uh, needs to operate with security and now it's operating without security. Does the law of property provide any relief for those who rent property or own property subject to a mortgage and can no longer make the necessary payments because of uh, unemployment due to COVID-19. In general, uh, the law of property places the risk of loss of possession or ownership due to financial hardship squarely on tenants and mortgagors. However, legislatures have provided some relief and the United States Supreme Court in 1934 during the Great Depression held that governments have uh, considerable ability to modify property rules in times of economic emergency. The effect of lockdown measures on the homeless, landlords and tenants, and also persons that are living in informal settlements is another important aspect. The forced relocation of the already poor and marginalized might pose significant constitutional questions that would have implications both for disaster management but also for town planning. In various jurisdictions, including South Africa, there's also been a ban placed on evictions during the time or the duration of the lockdown. And this, of course, has significant um, implications for the power dynamic that ordinarily exists in property relationships. The disease itself is rooted in dichotomies that plague spatial and policy planning, three of which are very critical. The first is that of the rural and the urban. The second is that of the formal and the informal, and the third is that of the private and the public. Read together, these dichotomies manifest in slums and squatter settlements. These are the material markers of these dichotomies. It is critical that we seize this moment of the invisible having gone visible. One way of doing that is to address, for those who have gone back, to address their uh, requirements of livelihoods to retain them in the rural areas. No owner who keeps their apartment speculatively vacant 
should have the right to do so. This is not what property is supposed to, to mean. Pandemics of this nature have the tendency to show the stark inequality that exists in any country. And this was so true for South Africa. For property lawyers like myself, it becomes necessary to analyze the ways in which property rights are affected by exceptional measures that are needed to provide for the public health and safety during a global pandemic such as the coronavirus. Various questions become important. For instance, what is the constitutional framework in which the South African government must ordinarily operate so as to provide the necessary protection of property rights? And how are these property rights then changed or affected by a declaration of a state of disaster? COVID-19 pandemic has made crude demonstrations of spatial unevenness created by capitalism. Massive reverse migration that was witnessed from most of the Indian cities to rural areas after a national lockout was declared was a symptom of spatial inequality of capitalist development. What pandemics can do to property is mediated through what pandemics do to social structures. It is here social mutations of pathogens become more important than its genetic mutations. This class war of livelihood versus virus is a creation of special inequality. Poor families living in overcrowded apartments or the homeless are excluded from safely staying at home. Even if apartments or houses around them are unused, they still belong to someone whose property rights exclude the homeless and the poor from, from using the vacant properties. As a planner, I firmly believe the time is ripe for the profession to reclaim its historic proposition of making cities inclusive and livable. In order to halt the spread of the disease, numerous cities are introducing emergency measures, such as halts on eviction. We need to work towards turning those short-term concessions into long-term recovery strategies. To succeed, planners will have to relearn how to speak truth to power, to forge locally relevant alliances that allow us to activate the progressive tools of our profession, that ultimately allow us to reverse the effects of financialization, recover the social value of land in our cities, make them places to work, live and play, not commodities for sale. Is this pandemic going to have an impact on how we reflect on uh, high density urban areas that have proven to be very vulnerable in this crisis? If yes, planning is going to play a fundamental role. And um, the notion of, of property as a freehold state has to necessarily be challenged. Property entails obligation. What that could mean, we've learned, we learn at the moment at the Corona crisis. The most important obligation you could think of is the obligation to use your property for social distancing. If you own property, then you have the obligation to stay home. And, and how do we remember the social obligation of property once the crisis is over? And different tales and different rationals of property pop up again. The pandemic has brought to the fore the devastating impacts of decades of financialization everywhere. Planning has been ineffective, complacent, worse. It's been complicit in displacing communities to make space for urban renewal. As is true throughout the developed world, it is not uncommon for some families to have a second property, often a cabin in a rural area. In the US, the media is now full of articles about local elected officials, often very politically conservative officials, officials traditionally most supportive of private property rights, leading the way to prepare local laws which would prevent owners of these properties from coming to them. One recent headline read, defenders of property rights find something else they want to defend, their own communities. The reason? fear for the introduction of COVID-19 by those who are not full-time residents of their community and may be coming from urban centers. So whose property is it? What is dominant, the rights of the owner or those of the community? Think that those poor living conditions are the direct outcomes of the commodification of land globally. 
the prioritization of financial investment over the right to shelter, the warehousing of the poor in cramped districts in order to leave free reign to capital that has turned entire urban districts into places to park its money. In Beirut, the city where I live, medical workers who are putting their lives on the line, as well as hundreds of lower income individuals needing a safe space during the pandemic are desperately looking for affordable shelter. Meanwhile, more than 100 multi-story apartment buildings have been fully emptied by developers. They keep them on hold until it becomes lucrative to demolish them for profit. The prioritization of health over economy has diminished the importance of economic dimension of land property and upgraded its social dimension. At the same time, social distancing has imposed a more individual than collective consumption in public goods. This new normal, though, is for those who can afford it. What could we, as planners, suggest as an effective response to virus? To broaden home ownership in quantity and quality. To improve and enrich public property. To increase access to affordable housing and to public space. To upgrade informal settlements and to provide access to essential services as water, housing, and healthcare were needed. If the past is a guide to the future, society will develop new restrictions on the rights of private property owners, as society as a whole and its health is privileged. For those who, have con who continue to live in the city but cannot claim the city fully, the city has to respond. One way of responding it Responding to this crisis is by creating what I would say is uh, transitional property. This pandemic should reawaken interest in green spaces. They are more than just passive spaces for amenity and leisure. They have always offered us a broader range of benefits for our health and well-being, as spaces of natural habitats and biodiversity, as flood retention areas as areas of free, public, open space in increasingly privatised cities. They are not simply a nice thing to have. Property is not an individual right, but a social function. And we need property reform, emphasising property as a social function. And property reform must be based on social responsibility and the notion of humanity is interdependence. Mm -hmm.